Um, welcome to Soul DXB. And uh, my name is Bobito Garcia, aka Cool Bob Love. And today we cool are. Cool Cucumber DJ Slice as well. It's DJ Cucumber Slice. Slice, excuse me, sir. Slice, Slice, it's okay. We have the CEO of Mass Appeal. Please give a nice round of applause for Peter Bimbender. What's up, brother? You good? Welcome to Feeling Soul good. DXB. Thank you. Your first time here? It is my first time at Seoul, and I'm loving it. It's incredible out here. Good stuff, man. So, um, if you don't know, Mass Appeal is a multimedia, multi-platform, cool person thing to be a part of. And Peter is sort of the, the nucleus of a, a lot of parts that just have gotten thrown out in the universe and are expanding and, and, and growing. But we're going to pull it back to the 90s. When Massive Hill f was first founded in 96, from a personal narrative, I started my store, Bobito's Footwork, in 96 in New York on 9th Street between 1st and 2nd, which was the same location that Fat Beats was, which was a, a legendary uh, record store. And when I started my store, my vision. <laughs> Shut up! <laughs> when I started my store. What the? What's going on? They're hyping us, bro. Oh. Okay. I, it sounded like me. It did sound like Right? Me. Anyway. Your voice carries. I wanted to carry sneakers in my store. I wanted to have vinyl in my store. I wanted to have markers. I wanted to have fat laces. I wanted like a one-stop hip-hop boutique, which didn't exist. One of the elements that was part of that was graffiti magazines. So I had On The Go, which was Steve Powers, AKA Espo's publication. I had Eagle Trip, which was Sasha Jenkins' publication with Gabe and um, Brent and uh, uh, his other partner, who I'm forgetting right now, because I just woke up. And I had uh, Early Vice, and I had While We Were Sleeping. One of those magazines was Mass Appeal. and um, it did very well in the, in the shop, and uh, they lasted for about six years. So, Peter, I want to open up with you and just give us a sense. What was your relationship at that nascent era for Mass Appeal? Were you buying the magazine? Were you reading it? Were you diving into it, or were you completely unaware? Um, I was living in New Mexico. Um, for anybody who doesn't know, that's a very uh, sort of random pocket of America living in a city called Santa Fe, and hip-hop wasn't huge there, but I grew up in New York, and my family had moved to Santa Fe, New Mexico, so fortunately, there were certain stores that carried magazines. Uh, Mass Appeal was one of them, so in the 96, when Mass Appeal was started, I was living there, and um, I was buying it every time it came out, and that was, that was my early connection to Mass Appeal. It was just literally a fan of hip-hop, going out, buying the magazine, reading it, being in a place like Santa Fe, like, waiting for that magazine or waiting, there was other magazines at that time. That was one of the only ways you could sort of stay in connection with what was happening because the internet wasn't popping back then really. So it was really about the magazines and, and Mass Appeal was one of the dope ones, so. What, any um, articles or covers of Mass Appeal in that era kind of stick out in your brain? Like, did you have tear sheets like, you know, taped up on your wall? <laughs> I did have some of those. Um, the, the Ghostface MF Doom one is one that stands out to me in particular because I was waiting for that album. So when that one came out, I was like, ah, because I felt like the album was actually like about to be real, which everybody in this room who's a fan of either one of those artists now know the album is not real. Uh, or if it is, we'll probably never get it. Um, so yeah, there was that. I mean, not Nas and Large Pro. They did, Eric, they did uh, Rakim and Eminem. It was just always dope collaborations. And there'd be like, some random cover with somebody you'd never heard of, but it was just great art direction. So I was drawn to the magazine from like a design standpoint, and then also it was just like super cool in terms of, it was really early on artists, so you know, the first article about a, like a Kid Cudi, for example, would be in a mass appeal. We covered guys like Bob Ito, so um, yeah, a lot of stuff. And back, back then, did you, did you realize this is a hard question to, to ask this early in the stage, but when you were diving into the magazine in the 90s, 
What did it mean to you in, in a grander scale? Or you know, I remember when the source was a four-page newsletter coming out of Harvard University, right? And then they moved to New York in 1990, and then like five years later, they were out selling on the newsstand, Rolling Stone, Spin. Like these magazines were coming out <clears throat> in that in that era. Some weren't sticking. You know, there were a lot of dope uh, flavor magazine out of Seattle. Uh, straight from the lip out of San Diego. You know, there were dope hip hop magazines coming from regional areas that, that weren't having uh, sustainable uh, businesses. But did you see Mass Appeal at that point having longevity or did you not even think about it? Because, you know, the 90s was interesting. You know, we had hip hop artists that were coming out and disappearing. Then we had other stuff like The Source that was going over the top, you know, becoming like a lot bigger than anyone thought. It could be. So did you have any perspective of it at that point? I, I would love to claim I did, because that, be, that would be awesome. But um, no, I was just a fan reading it. I was actually going to culinary, culinary school um, when I got to college. So I wasn't even thinking about a profession, career in hip hop. Um, it was literally just uh, a passion point of mine. And somebody just loved, loved the music and that type of stuff. It wasn't like, oh, one day I want to be making movies or have a record label. I was literally trying to learn how to cook and one day open restaurants. So that was not, not part of my plan, um, but it happened naturally. So how do you, I mean, let, give us some of the history, if you will. Mass Appeal lasted from 96 to 2002. 2008. 2008, oh, two, okay, 2008. What, what was the uh, chronology of the, of the publication and how did it end? Um, so in 96, when it was started, it was really just a graffiti magazine. If you were like a graffiti head, you'd mail in your photos, you'd want to get recognized by Mass Appeal. It was like super authentic graffiti publication. And over time, it started to cover more things like hip hop and, um, you know, street fashion and just sort of to broaden uh, the, the editorial perspective. Unfortunately, one of the founders passed away in 2005. Um, I don't know if you want to go to that other slide yet. So there was two founders of the magazine, um, and Patrick passed away in 2005. So at that point, wait, let's let's backtrack. Who who are the founders of the original Mass Appeal? Right there, those those two gentlemen, Patrick Elastic and Adrian Moeller, um, two graffiti kids who literally were just like fans of uh, the culture. Were graffiti heads. They wanted to start a magazine. They started it, and uh, they grew it really organically and successfully just by themselves. Um, unfortunately, one of them passed. Adrian kept the magazine going for as long as he could without, without his partner, but ultimately in 2008, he had another business that was starting to take off. You know, he has Colossal, Colossal Media in New York. So Adrian now runs a business in New York. If you guys ever go to the city, you see these huge hand-painted murals. Um, so he literally took his graffiti artist that he had built these incredible relationships with and started paying, having brands pay him to do hand-painted murals which is an incredible business that he's now built, you know, to pretty, pretty big scale. He's doing it in like 20 different cities. But without, without the other co-founder, he sort of put Mass Appeal to rest. Um, always knewing he wanted to bring it back to life, but, you know, took, took a while for us to partner up. All right. So let's talk about some of your personal narrative. You, uh, New York, New Mexico, what's your, what's your educational path leading up to you becoming a businessman prior to the formation of Decon? Um, I mean, really... It, well, are, are you okay with that question? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I'm just trying to think about... I mean, both my parents were entrepreneurs, so that sort of ran in my blood. Um, but honestly, it just started with, you know, going to culinary school, wanting to be in, be in the restaurant business, and then realizing, like, all right, I'm not going to be a, a, a chef. Like... I had this dream of being a chef, but when I got into it, I realized like that's super competitive. The, the business is something that I'll never be the best chef. Um, I started looking at the business side of restaurants. That got me excited, so I started managing restaurants. Um, Still in New Mexico? Or no, no, now I was in New York. Now in New York. In, yeah, yeah. Okay. I left New York. I left New Mexico to go back to New York to go to NYU. So, um, and then I made a movie when I was in, in college with uh, one of my now business partners, this guy named Jason Goldwatch. And he was a hip-hop video director. I think you remember he was doing like early raucous videos and 
you know, most deaf and dilated peoples. And he was just a kid from California that was doing really early, like innovative, independent hip hop videos. We linked up and um, one thing led to another and we made a movie. That movie is called One Big Trip. It's a little embarrassing, but I, I still tell people about it because um, it was me going around the country with a bunch of friends doing a lot of drugs. But um, it, was a, it was a good movie nonetheless, and it did very well. Um, but Jason actually was able to make a great soundtrack. He called up all the guys that uh, he was basically producing music videos for and said, dilated, you know, hieroglyphics. Like, I need you guys to do an original song for this soundtrack. And we ended up making a soundtrack for this first film. The soundtrack became really successful. And that sort of launched the first company that Jason and I started called Decon um, with this one movie. So, Wow. All right, so... Who funded the film? Who funded the formation of, of Decon? So the film was made for like $30,000. So honestly, it was like, there was like five or six characters in the film. And we were basically going on like a big vacation and just videotaping it. So everybody kicked in a little bit of money. I put in a little bit more because I was the only one with a real job because I was still cooking at that point and working in restaurants. Um, but yeah, we made it super inexpensively. It was back when you were shooting stuff on high eight. So we had like a hundred little of those, you know, little tiny tapes and, uh, you know, super, super, you know, do it yourself kind of style. It wasn't a crew. It was me shooting and Jason shooting and the other people shooting. And uh, it was a fun experience. Yeah. So <clears throat> you release this soundtrack and it leads you to form Decon. How are you? What's your vision now with? Okay, we got the soundtrack out, we got the film, check. Like, let's move forward. How are you uh, getting other artists to believe in the Decon label? Who are you releasing? You know, you're, I'm imagining that you're still in New York now, but you're traveling, you, you, you know, you're getting your hands and experiences and, and network a little bit further. Walk us along that path. Yeah, so basically we, we were really lucky because Jason, as I mentioned, had been doing a lot of great music videos. So he had a bunch of relationships in the space. And, um, you know, we put out this one project, One Big Trip, and it was cool because it was one side was a CD and one side was a DVD. We were one of the first people to ever take advantage of this new, at that point it was like this hot new technology. Um, <laughs> cra crazy to think about it. But uh, basically we put it out and it did really, really well, um, surprisingly, because we had no expectations at that point. Because of the artists that were on the soundtrack, you know, we had Del the Funky Homo Sapien, Jurassic Five, Royce the Five Nine, Dilated, like people that were really uh, respected. The soundtrack sold like 100,000 copies, which was a lot. I mean, you ran an independent record label, Fondalum, so you, you know how hard it is independently to sell records. Even at that time, that was, that was successful. That's, that's a, yeah, that's a lot, lot. Yeah, I mean, it didn't happen immediately. It wasn't like first week, but over a couple years, it was... The project kind of caught on. So that made money. And then we just started reaching out to other artists. Some of those artists that we had done music videos for didn't have labels, uh, just were super independent. And we were able to say, hey, let's, let's not do like a traditional, let's sign for five albums, but let's just do a project. Let's partner up, let's make a you know, bunch of music videos, let's make an EP. And we put out a bunch of those records with, with you know, a variety of artists. and. Uh, it was cool. And so this, de this decon stage for your career is from 2002 to what? Um, well, I mean, decon still exists. So, I mean, now inside of Mass Appeal, decon is a specific division where it's sort of a commercial production company. We were producing content and we had a music, music label. So it's a little bit of like working with brands and then we we're also producing, you know, content for artists. So decon still exists, 2002 to hopefully 2,000 ever. Um, but yeah, it still exists just in a different form. So Decon does make this transition to working with brands. Is that something that you devised or is that something that kind of happened organically or is that something that the brands were like seeing what you were doing and solicited you? What, what was, the, what was the, the spark? The connection, yeah. I mean, honestly, it happened both ways because we had we had sort of this creative production company. So content was now becoming, I mean, now everybody knows content is like the hot thing, but this is, you know, a dozen plus years back. So 
we were able to produce content, we were able to do it inexpensively and, and really kind of with high production value. So brands started hitting us up. And the fact that we had artists, you know, kind of not on speed dial, but we had really great relationships. We could work with the video game companies, we could work with uh, different TV shows. So we did, you know, for 2K Sports, which was a big hip hop inspired basketball game, which, which I think you've done, you've done stuff I, for them. Yeah, I was the announcer for 2K8, 2K9, and 2K10 for the dunk contest. Exactly. Yeah, but, um, but for sure, I mean, to this day, I also did NBA Street Volume 2 and Volume 3. Those video games were responsible for introducing a lot of old school, or, well, depends on your age, but, uh, <laughs> but a lot of 90s hip hop to a whole new generation that were, their entry point was, I love video games, and then they're like, oh my God, I love Pete Rock and CL Smooth now, you know, and they're like going back and listening to the album. I still get that to this day. You know, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, so many of the artists, we got really lucky because we ended up supervising the NBA 2K property for four years. So 2K, five, six, seven, and eight, we did all the music. So when you're doing the music for a game at that magnitude, like every artist basically is like, you know, sending you stuff, their managers are hitting you up. So we became friends with a lot of talent simply because we had the ability to place their music in, in a super important place like a video game. So I'm, so I'm not, I mean, I'm, of course I'm seeing the label, but how does 2K hit up Decon to curate the video game? Is that, is that a trust thing? Or like, had you made a, so much noise with the, uh, the Big Trip soundtrack? Like, you know, why didn't they hit up me and Stretch? <laughs> I, was, I was persistent. Um, you guys were doing a radio, oh no, you weren't doing the radio show back then, right? It wasn't, and 98? Yeah, we stopped doing a show in 98. 98, yeah. I mean, we, we, it, it honestly just started. One year, we did one song. The next year, I pitched the person there. We came to be friends. I was like, listen, you're paying this money to, do, to license a song. You know, you're spending X amount of dollars to just pay somebody to do, put their song in the video game. Like, you could pay a little bit more, and these people could do original songs for your games, and the value that creates when you have something original and bespoke is so much greater than just paying somebody for a song that everybody's heard before. So I sold the marketing guy on, listen, if you let us do you know, custom music for your video games, we can go out to all the artists that we had relationships with. And it was like the best of both worlds because I'm bringing all my friends to check and literally then on the other side, I'm bringing this video game company like incredible original music that the fans were you know, super happy to hear. So that was kind of like our secret sauce at, at the company is we were able to interface with brands and hip hop, you know, unfortunately, like, especially at that point, there weren't a lot of companies who were able to deal with like corporate America, quote unquote, and then also deal with the artists in a sort of fair and creative way. So we became one of the companies that was able to talk to a 2K Sports, or we did the music for the TV show Mad Men. Um, what? Yeah, we did the theme music for Mad Men. So when you have a moment like that, literally every music supervisor, every artist, you become quickly on their radar because that show went from like never, nobody never heard of it to being the hottest show in you know basically like the first season, so. Incredible. Um, so you have this foundation in drugs, music. <laughs> Nothing's changed. <laughs> um, what we got here? Oh, this is just more decon. Just some of the albums that we put out through decon. So it was cool because we got to work with artists like Jay Electronica, who still has yet to put out an album. That's again not my fault. Okay, I wasn't responsible for Doom or Ghostface or Jay Electronica, but we did put out Pusha T's first album, and it was cool because it was uh, it was a unique mix of like producing stuff for brands like Absolute, doing content, but then also putting out music. Um, so there's a ton more you guys can see, but I wanted to just give you a little little taste. So um, let's talk about Decon as a creative agency, because now you're doing the music stuff, but you're slowly shifting into expanding beyond just music. So kind of give us, walk us through what, what that transition was and how, and how is it opening up, you know, opportunities are coming, you're taking advantage of them, and how is it opening up your horizons as an as a agency? Yeah, I mean, so it was, it was a great uh, learning experience being able to work with brands and, you know, the money you have as an independent hip-hop label, as I'm sure you, you well know from running one, is, is not a lot. 
even if you are successful, it's a, it's a grind, grind it out every single day of the week kind of, uh, kind of business. But when you're able to call a brand and you know, tap into the corporate budgets of a 2K Sports or an Absolute or a, a big television network, it's a completely different you know, opportunity. So it was nice because we were able to balance the, you know, the stay cool, work with the artists, but then also work with major brands who needed um, a cool partner who could help them connect with the youth and connect with sort of urban culture. So to us, it was just like, we never wanted to be doing too much of one thing. It was a mixture. We had to have a couple great brand clients and we weren't out there like a traditional agency really pitching. We just built relationships with a few people at a couple critical brands, 2K Sports of the World, you know, Paramount Pictures. And those people really were just supportive of us for, I mean, some of them we still work with to this day through Mass Appeal. So um, that was great. And it was great for the artists because they got to receive the benefit of those corporate relationships, whether it was in terms of performance opportunities or you know, doing original music or you know, whatever you can think of, video content. Um, so it was really just like a nice cycle of brands wanting us to do stuff. And then it wasn't always our artists because we had a small group of them. But if it wasn't our artists, it was close friends of our family. And we just kind of kept cycling the opportunities through those, through those friends and family. Nice. Um, can you tell me what time, what's the time on this? <clears throat> Beautiful. We're right on the mark. Right on the mark. So, um, You've done this before. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you have the success with Decon, and then someone has the light bulb to relaunch Mass Appeal, and you also partner with Nas, this phenomenal, legendary MC slash recording artist, and Sasha Jenkins, who's the former co-founder, head of Ego Trip, which I'm, I'm curious, how did you meet both of them, connect with both of them, who, who was the starting point? Was it Nas approaching you, like, yo, let's relaunch Mass Appeal? Or was it you being like, let's relaunch Mass Appeal, let me reach out to Nas? Like, how did that? Because you, you pulled together, like, like an all-star crew. Sasha lucky, is an yes. all-star in publishing. Tell, tell people Sasha's, because I can't speak about him as well. You've known him longer than I have. Sasha Jenkins is this brilliant mind who, with three other cats, started a publication called Ego Trip, which was legendary for the 90s. Then he transitioned and started doing TV shows, uh, being a creative producer for MTV. Uh, um, I forget the name of the show. It was like White, what was it? White Rapper Show. White Rapper Show. Um, and then, uh, then Ego Trip published a book called Ego Trip Book of Rap List, which was at the forefront of hip hop publishing so, like, Sasha's, like, kind of, like, this dude who's always at the forefront. He's a multi-hyphenate. Yeah, he really is. Yeah. He's always at the forefront of these new ways to contextualize hip-hop in, in a presentation to the public. So, he did a TV, he did publications, and then he joins you with Mass Appeal. And Mass Appeal kind of jumps out there as not a publication now, but as this sort of multimedia platform. That's a, I'm really curious as to what's the genesis of that relationship with Nas. For those who don't know, he released an album called Illmatic in 94. My estimation, still the best hip hop album that's ever been produced, period. I hope everybody knows about Nas period. in this room, okay? First and foremost. Sorry, if you don't agree with me, I don't care. I agree with you. But that's just the deal. Um, so yeah, so talk about the genesis, the relationship, the connection, and then the, the light bulb that goes on to, to release Mass Appeal. Well, Not the light- release Mass Appeal, to relaunch. To relaunch, yeah. yeah. I mean, that light bulb, I gotta give all credit to Sasha. Sasha had been somebody that I'd met through the business. He saw what I was doing at Decon. He was literally thinking about doing basically the same type of business where he was gonna partner with brands and take his ability to sort of understand urban culture and. He was doing content and he was a journalist. And I mean, his credits are really, really deep. And if you guys haven't seen his movie Fresh Dressed, I hope you guys Let's all make it. Let's not get to that yet. Let's not get okay, to sorry, that yet. Okay, sorry, sorry. I just want to, oh, I got to plug Sasha. Um, Come back. So, so, so sorry. <laughs> um, anyway, so Sasha came to me and basically said, 
you know, you're doing incredible shit. Really, really big fan of Mass Appeal. I mean, of Decon and what you're doing. Are you familiar with Mass Appeal? I'm like, dude, of course. Mass Appeal is like one of the brands that was super critical. And wait, and I'm gonna stop you there. He's coming to you saying you're doing incredible shit. How did the two of you know each other? So I have a friend called uh, his name's Philip Leeds. He worked with Pharrell for years on BBC and Ice Cream, and uh, he and Sasha were boys. Basically, they started talking about launching an agency. And Philip's like, dude, Peter's so far ahead of us, we should just go to him and try and partner with him because it would be a waste of our time to try and rebuild what he's basically already started. Um, so Philip Leeds, if you want to really take it back a level, um, was the person who put Sasha and I in the same room together. And then Nas and I knew each other because I had directed, or not directed, excuse me, I'd, my, one of my business partners had directed a bunch of his music videos and I had produced them. So Nas and I had become friends. Um, when we launched, I've known him for 10 years now, so we've had Mass Appeal for almost four, little, close to five. So we'd known each other for about five years prior to us partnering on Mass Appeal. And for anybody who doesn't know, Nas's investment game as of recent has been pretty incredible. He's Lyft to Dropbox to Sweet Chick restaurants and all kinds of other things. So when I brought him Mass Appeal, that was something he didn't have. He didn't have a media brand. He didn't have a, a sort of connection to urban so, culture. So. You and Sasha launched Mass Appeal. Nas comes on as a partner later. No, we launched it together. We went, we went to Sasha with the idea and basically said, hey, Mass Appeal is this incredible brand. Nas, you were on the cover. He was like, oh, shit, I was. You're right. Like, that was a while ago, <laughs> literally. Um, so we, um, we just started talking about, like, what was happening. And there was Vice and there was Complex and there was all these other brands in the space. But, um, you know, Mass Appeal had been gone since 2008, so it had been dormant for, for four, four plus years at that point. Um, so Nas was immediately down. It was literally one telephone call, and he was like, I'm in. Tell me, tell me where to wire the money. It was like that conversation. So, time out. Why Nas? Because there's artists, I mean, you know, he is top of the food chain for me as far as, you know, album release. But... And you know him for five years, but what's your knowledge of him as a businessman? Because he did have, he had some financial problems for a little while. Um, are you looking at Nas to partner to launch? I mean, Sasha's like, it's, it's an easy check. It's like, boom, creative, you know, journalist, writer, producer, check, 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 check. You, easy check, boom, boom, boom. It's Nas like, oh, we can attach his name to the project and that'll bring attention and authenticity to yeah, our brands, or is it like, yo, he's an intellectual, he's, he's mega intelligent, he's gonna, he's mega creative, we don't really know him in the space of agency, but we can, we can juice him for that, or was it the, you know, his funds, or, you know, what's really that, how is that cultivate, you know, because to me, like, Nas is not a natural person to, to partner with. Who would you have partnered with? Because Nas to me is, is is completely a natural person. Just I mean I know him. In no, a, I'm in not trying. I'm not trying to. No, no, I know. I'm saying like it's it's brilliant that you partner with with him, but I'm saying like if for someone starting an agency, I I I wouldn't think, not like yeah. Nas is not the natural person to think, you know, let me partner with this dude because he didn't have any agency or he didn't have any creative work outside of his music. He didn't have any brands at that point. You know what I'm saying? Like he's not. He wasn't the entrepreneur that he is now. So. Th you're hitting point. him at, at early. Point. We were early with him. Yeah. yeah. He just got it. I mean, honestly, it was one telephone call. We talked about how there could be an opportunity to produce content that was focused around hip hop. He was a really big fan of Sasha. He and I were just friends at that point. Um, you know, we weren't asking for a ton of money. So it was just everything sort of just lined up. And it was a business that, you know, a lot of his investments, even though they weren't really well known, the few that he did have that were sort of public were things that had no connection to hip hop culture. Literally, they were like, cat, you know, Lyft or Dropbox, or literally like tech, tech things that his manager had got him involved with. So he'd been looking to do something that was like, just part of who he was as a person. And the fact that he was on a cover, and the fact that the brand had such authenticity, he just felt like, oh, this is easy. I don't have to, I don't have to go out there and really sell the brand to people because the brand was part of hip hop when I was coming up. I mean, Nas, 94. Mass Appeal 96, so the brand's kind of, you know, his brand and Mass Appeal's brand kind of were sort of grown together to some degree. And <clears throat> Nas and Sasha, what was their relationship? Or was, were you the, the they conduit? Went, they to, went to junior high school together. 
which is hilarious because every time I go to a meeting, they end up telling the same story. I've heard it probably a hundred times at this point. <laughs> the teacher told us that we should both go to vocational school because there's no future for us. And they actually use it in, in, in uh, any, every meeting we go to because it's a great story. But they, went, they were both from Queens and they went to junior high together. And um, Nas ended up dropping out. Sasha finished school. Nas went on to obviously write Illmatic and, and become one of, uh, if not the greatest uh, hip hop artist of all time. And Sasha followed his dreams as a journalist and a writer. So they had a connection long before I did. Um, but yeah, that's how they met. I, you know, it's funny, like now you say that Sasha's a dear friend, personal, like not just business hip hop stuff. And uh, he did mention that one day, like just, he just threw that out there like, oh yeah, by the way, you're like, what? And Nas and I went to junior high. <laughs> All right, Crazy. Sasha. So now you're the odd man out. I'm the odd man out. Yeah, they cut me out of that. Um, but, uh, you know, now Nas and I have a, have a really great relationship. And, uh, you know, it's awesome. It's just grown. We all, we all play different parts of the business. You know, Nas continues to not really get hands-on with, like, everything. But anytime he needs content produced or he needs help with a brand, we work with him on Hennessy, Timberland. So it's cool, he brings in the agency to help with all of his brand partners, which is great because he trusts us. And then when we need, you know, we, we, we uh, debuted a movie here last night uh, called Word is Bond. So when we need Nas, he's obviously there to support any of our endeavors, whether it's appearing in a film or coming to an event. Speaking of events, hopefully I'll, I'll get him out here at some point, um, make that happen one day. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a great, great combination because Sasha and Nas have their own relationship. Nas and I have our own relationship and we sort of balance each, you know, balance everyone out in terms of the projects we tackle and the, the things we like to do. So, um, so now you, so you, so you relaunch Mass Appeal and clearly you're like, okay, we have this creative agency, we have this label, Mass Appeal had its, had its followers. How, what, what are the steps that you take from that nucleus to expand it and, and have it branch out into all these other, oh, do we have a video? No, Let's give a shout out to Annie. Annie, put, put pressing the buttons. Um, it was really just an extension of what we've been doing under Decon and then we got the basic things going and then we just started to expand upon it. Um, you know, we were really lucky the first year we launched Mass Appeal, Sasha got the opportunity to direct the movie that I mentioned earlier called Fresh Dressed which got into Sundance. So that was a huge moment for us and the film has continued to do really well. It's premiering in Sweden next week at a film festival and it just kind of continues to have a life of its own. And then the other thing that was really huge is we partnered with a group called Run the Jewels. How many people in here know Run the Jewels? Okay, awesome. So um, they put out an album, it was incredible. They put out another album called Run the Jewels 2 which was like sort of the definitive album of the year it came out. It was Pitchforks, like number one album and it was just a really really important record so we had these two big moments happen at the same year and the first year we launched the i mean it was kind of like a dream opportunity to have a movie in sundance and have basically one of the hottest groups in hip-hop uh partnered with your label so we we start with a we started off with a bang you know i've been trying to repeat that year every year since amazing yeah. and um so now I'm imagining that that business is starting to pour in, right? And also your followers are pouring in. How are you managing all these requests? I'm sure like, I mean, Jeff Staple said it really well in the, in the last talk about, you know, he, you, we all get hit up like, yo, collab with this and not every relationship is the right one. So how are you discerning as a trio and as, and as a brand, which, which activations you're doing, which collaborations you're doing, what uh, solicitations you're doing, who are you still looking to solicit to expand to, like who are you trying to work with that you haven't yet? Yeah, I think for us it was just like, I, I wanted to surround myself with people like the younger versions of the Sasha Jenkins, you know, we wanted to have the next wave of really smart creative minds. So we were lucky, we, we were able to relaunch the magazine, we left copies out here for you guys, so please grab them and, and bring them and pass them to your friends and such. But um, we just had a lot of great incoming talent join the company really quickly. So it wasn't, it wasn't myself or Sasha or, or Nas. We had like 30 young kids who were really tapped into what was happening in culture, really 
hardworking and super, super creative who were bringing us idea after idea. So um, it was just a great, and, it, and it's now it's obviously grown quite a, lit, quite a bit, but um, we started with just a great team of people and everybody was able to sort of decipher like, uh, no, let's not focus on that, let's focus on this and, and so forth. So it was a lot of it was decision by committee. There wasn't anything where it was just like, you know, somebody really wants to do something and I was like, no, there was, a, there was sort of a group discussion. So when we decided we wanted to make a movie, there was 10 ideas of what should be our first movie and Fresh Dress was the one that sort of rose to the top. When we, when we look at artists that we want to partner with at Mass Appeal Records, you know, we see artists literally through the Mass Appeal media channels because we have a website and, and obviously, you know, a lot of other places where you can follow Mass Appeal. We get hit up by artists every single day, but Nas obviously has a very distinct brand and, you know, he's not going to partner with just any artist. Um, not because they're maybe not dope, but because it just doesn't fit into what his brand represents and he's not going to be able to stand next to somebody. So Run the Jewels, of course, amazing. We have another artist, I don't know how many people know Dave East. He's another artist that's real New York street, but lyrical. So a lot of it was just what makes sense for the brand, you know? And where, where are you, Sasha, and Nas clashing? Like, what are, what are your visions Getting Nas that to are finish not his album. Lot, I'm sorry? Getting Nas to finish his album. <laughs> That's a point of much, much discussion, no. Um, I mean, Sasha is very, very uh, definitive in the type of stuff he wants to do. So sometimes you need to reel him in a little bit in a, in a good way, just because he's very, I mean, you, you know him. He's super, super opinionated. So at times, when you're dealing with corporate America, their, their uh, you know, sort of barometer for what is acceptable to them sometimes Sasha, you know, you need to have the talks like, hey, you just got to take it down a little bit in this meeting because these people are not used to somebody talking. Hey, hey he just speaks with a lot of passion, so that's great. But sometimes he speaks, you know, about race or this or that, topics that are super, super important. But when you speak about them the first time to somebody, it's fine if you've known, gotten to build a relationship with somebody. You can speak about, oh, shit, push the T's, tell me to wrap it up. <laughs> nah, bro. Um, so... Anyway, the, um, you know, the projects that we're doing, I think, really speak to what we're, what we're about at Mass Appeal in terms of the authenticity and trying to do things that are progressing culture. Um, all right, so we're right at the 42-minute mark, which is bananas. That flew by. <laughs> um, let's open it up to questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand. Yes. Okay, the question was, next time you see Jay Electronica, can you please, and she gave a hand gesture, to force, force an album out of him. <laughs> I, I hope I don't have to see Jay Electronica. Um, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Jay and I have been through many things together. We went to Nepal. We shot a movie. Getting Exhibit C and Exhibit A to come out were probably some of the most difficult things I've ever had to do in terms of professionally. Um, but they're incredible songs, and I'm proud I was able to get them out. But I honestly can't say if Jay Electronica will ever put out an album at this point which is a bummer because I've heard three versions of what could have been a Jay Electronic album, and they are all superior to 99% of the music that's out right now in the market. So, so wait, if you heard three things that could have been an album, why, why weren't those released? I, that is the, the question of the century for, for that man. I mean, he's just, he's a perfectionist. You know, certain people are very particular about their art and their craft and, whether it's fear of failure, fear of letting down the fans. When you put out a song as big as Exhibit C and people put you on that pedestal of like, you are the next great rapper, you're here to save hip hop. I mean, for anybody who's a fan of his music, you were part of the hype that got him to the point where I think he sort of shut down at some point. Um, you know, we ended up doing a deal with Rock Nation. I thought maybe having Jay-Z get on board would help him put out the album, but it's been, I think, what, five, five, six years, and uh, nothing's come out, so. Another I'm, question? I'm, I'm hoping as much as everybody else, it drops. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yes. Definitely Nas, <laughs> okay? <laughs> well, maybe that'll actually get Jay Electronica to put it out. Let's see, Jay. Uh, you know, then maybe they'll do a joint album in 2050. Any other questions? 
Don't be shy. All right, no more questions. Um, so, future of Mass Appeal, moving forward, because basically you're living a daily dream that you probably couldn't have even fathomed when you were trying to be a chef. Uh, what's out there that that you're trying? What's what's out there that you're trying to attain that's like not within reach yet? I think probably just doing stuff more for us on a global scale. Like I don't know how many people in this room are even familiar with Mass Appeal before this this talk, but um, you know the stories we're telling. You might be familiar with the artists that we put out, or maybe seen one of the movies we put out, but just letting more people around the world see the stuff that we're doing. So coming to places like Dubai and, you know, traveling the brand, doing more events is definitely a big focus. Because right now in America, definitely in New York, I mean, you, if you're into hip hop in America, you know of Mass Appeal and, and, you know, other cities around the world, but trying to really, as hip hop grows globally, sort of grow Mass Appeal with it, I think is something that we're really excited about. And um, that's a focus of my attention next year. And then we got a lot going in terms of content. Um, a few TV series that are going to come out next year that I'm extremely excited about. We've, we've sort of graduated from doing cool, single, standalone documentaries to doing more episodic television. So we have a few series about hip-hop that are dropping in 2018 that are incredible, that we've put a lot of time into. So Can you mention the platform? Uh, one of them is with the largest streaming platform in the world. That's all I can say, but it's, it's kind of obvious. Um, <laughs> We, uh, we got some TV shows with TBS that we're doing. We have something with CNN. Um, just a bunch of different people right now. So we're really lucky in terms of we've sort of graduated to like one of the only premier production companies doing sort of smart hip hop urban related content. And there's a huge demand for content as we all know at this point, especially hip hop content. So it's been great for us because when people want to make a story about hip hop, we're one of the people that they call, and um, there's just so many great stories that haven't been told. So, I mean, next year is the 20th anniversary. We're talking about it right now of like, it's either the 25th or 20th anniversary of like 50 incredible albums. 93 and 98 were like two insane years for hip hop. So we're talking about doing a lot of stories around some of those classic albums that have never been told, the roots of them. Um, so yeah, a lot, lot of stuff, very excited. Follow us and we'll sort of keep you guys updated as things get announced. That's oh, really exciting. All right, question in the back. I mean, I think, I think you see it every day. It's like artists are taking control of their own destiny. They realize their power. You know, you look at a chance as a perfect example of an artist who's like, I'm going to do it all myself. And now he's built festivals. And he's doing, doing charitable work. And, um, you know, I think it's, it's that, that is the model today as these artists are taking control of their, their power and what they want to be doing. And um, that's what's exciting is because, you know, we at Massive, we're just a platform to help enable these, these, these artists um, realize their vision. So whether it's they want to executive produce a film or they want to partner and do um, you know, a music project or whatever it might be, um, we're seeing that more and more as artists sort of want to take control of that stuff. I, don't, I, don't, I think an artist, if they're, if they're a true artist, or is, is going to always be an artist. I think it's more about just expanding their horizons and starting to do things more than just recording a song or performing at a show. Um, you know, everybody's so, there's so many points of inspiration these days. So for an artist, it's a great source of, you know, material inspiration just to be able to be in the studio one day and then go work on a fashion line. I mean, Pusha's about to speak. Pusha's a great friend of mine. He's part of Mass Appeal as well. And, um, you know, what he's been able to do with his business, as he'll talk about next, is go from being a rapper to having a clothing line to running a record label to a few other things that, 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 uh, that hopefully he'll talk about as well. So I think that's, that's the future, and it's super excited to see artists now having that platform and the ability to, to do stuff sort of more independently. All right, any other questions? Yes. I love, I love that you asked that, first of all. For anybody who doesn't know, Rhythm Roulette is a, 
a digital series we put out where we blindfold producers, send them to the record store, and then they have to make a record out of three uh, vinyl pieces of vinyl they pick completely blindfolded. So series has been phenomenally successful, and we've had you know, everybody from the LPs and the Mac Millers, Mac Millers to Muramasa and Ninth Wonder do it. So we're starting to do more producers that are not just core, like hip hop people. Um, we're about to do our 100th episode, which is a big point of uh, excitement for us. Because when we did the series, we were like, oh, let's do a couple episodes and see if it works. And now like, literally we're on episode 97 right now, approaching episode 100. And we're trying to plan something huge for the 100th episode. So hopefully uh, that falls into place. But yeah, I mean, in terms of the Mass Appeal Records, we have DJ Shadow, who's probably one of the most well-recognized, you know, instrumental produce, you know, just producers and um, vinyl, vinyl heads. Still trying to get him to do his Rhythm Roulette episode. Um, he's a perfectionist, so is, uh, is, is uh, going forth with that. Manny Fresh, a um, couple other people we're looking at now. Yeah, so producers, is, it's a big part of what we do at Mass Appeal. Word. All right, everybody. I think we're going to wrap this. Pete is going to hang out for a little bit. Uh, if you want to have pictures and you know, give him a pound, whatever. Let's give a nice round of applause for Peter. Thank you guys very much. It's great being here. <laughs>